people and were going to organize. A few years later, 1985, it became the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, an organization that still exists today. Also in 1985, something tragic was happening. Gay men literally started falling down and dying. First in New York, then in Los Angeles, and then in San Francisco. And in San Francisco is where what was first known as the gay-related immune deficiency, GRID, became an epidemic first in the heart of San Francisco, in the heart of the gay community in San Francisco. And it spread. At that time, when no one really knew what was going on, it was pretty overwhelming for this young but energized movement of gay people trying to begin to fight for their rights. And just as they're starting to fight for their rights, they are literally dying by the hundreds. Imagine, if you will, if you are all the gay community, I'll just use San Francisco as an example because I know it best. If you are the gay community of San Francisco, and it's April, by the end of June, everyone on this half of the room is dead. And half of the people sitting on this side of the room are sick and dying. And the other half of people in this side of the room is trying to care for them. Many of the people sick and dying had never even told their family they were gay. Now they had this disease, which went from being gay-related immune deficiency to acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And one of the organizations, in fact, the organization that helped talk about how AIDS needed to be portrayed in the media and talked about in the media was the organization that I had the honor of being the president and CEO of, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. GLAD was formed in New York City in response to the AIDS crisis because terrible terminology was being used even in the New York Times back then about the disease and about what was going on. And activists went and talked to the New York Times and said, you've got to stop this. You are not fairly talking about these people. These are people who are dying of this disease and you're making it sound like it's, it's happening somewhere and these people deserve no recognition at all. And GLAD was formed and as was mentioned, grew to be the third largest organization in the cadre of organizations fighting for full equality. The legal group, the activist group with the task force, the media advocacy and anti-defamation voice with GLAD, and the last leg of the four-leg stool, the political group. The political group actually started in 1978. It was called the Gay Rights National Lobby. Then it became the Human Rights Campaign Fund, and it was a PAC. Only did political work. The modern Human Rights Campaign started in 1989 and has grown from just 25,000 members to well over a million. But that epidemic, that epidemic that hit in the mid-80s, just as the movement was starting to gain traction, how to impress this upon you, it literally, literally took half or more than half of the men who were involved in, the, in, the, in this young movement for full equality. They died. And credit must be given and should be given to our lesbian sisters and others in the straight community as well who picked up the responsibility, took on the responsibility, and kept many of these organizations alive as literally the leadership of these organizations and the funders of these organizations died over a period of time. Now, I wouldn't be doing my job well if I didn't remind everyone a little bit of the history. Because many of you look like you're young, perhaps you don't know the history. But when this was going on, our government failed us. Our government refused to acknowledge what was going on with AIDS. 
even as celebrities got sick. It wasn't until women, children, started getting sick from either transfusions or from a sexual partner that the government started saying, hey, wait a minute, we, we really maybe should do something about this. And there was a group of primarily men in New York and in LA called ACT UP, uh, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash, Unleash Power, ACT UP. They went to the government and demanded the National Institute of Health do studies about the disease. And they demanded that drug trials to stop the progression of the disease, which normally would take 24 or 36 months, be accelerated because literally, friends, literally half the room was dying every few months. So those people in ACT UP deserve a tremendous amount of credit. I, for one, I am so grateful for them, and I honor them, and I speak about them whenever I have the chance, because they were doing work that I didn't have the courage to do at that time in my life. I was a little younger than them, perhaps, but I wasn't out. I wasn't public about my sexual orientation. I was in the safety of the closet. Now, true. Safety of the closet probably saved my life. I acknowledge that, and I appreciate that aspect of it. But I must acknowledge and appreciate the people who were out and who were fighting for my equality when I didn't have the courage to do it. And that goes all the way back to when I was an undergraduate student at ASU in 1974. 19, I was a freshman in 74, 74, 75. I was one of those semi-jock fraternity kids that wasn't out, but yet people knew that I was gay. I wasn't out publicly, but I had some gay friends and socialized in gay circles, but not the out circles, right? That was for those guys that sat at the booth on the mall wearing their t-shirts, it was called Free Spirit, was the name of the gay club at ASU at the time. And I would walk right by them. I would walk right by them. One of those guys was named Greg Carmack. And I have here the editorial that Greg wrote in 1975 that was printed in a newspaper, some of you may know, called The New Times. It's been around a long time. Greg was an openly gay activist at the time. We knew each other by sight and by smile. He never challenged me in my closet. I never acknowledged him in his openness, in the work that he was doing that allowed me one day to be the first openly gay mayor in the United States. One of the things Greg wrote in 1975 is powerful. It's in this editorial. He wrote, we must open, since 1975, we must open our eyes to the fact that only through actively pushing the doors open will change come about. In our state of Arizona, there actually is a strong gay movement. In many states, there are strong gay movements. They do exist, and yet the laws that oppress gay people still exist, and we must slowly but consciously do everything we can to change that. Could have been written today. Time passed, of course, in 75, and 85, in the AIDS epidemic, and here we find ourselves now in the modern movement, the trajectory of the movement, over the last 40-some years since the Stonewall Inn. We've made tremendous progress but we are not fully equal. We are not full citizens. I can get married tomorrow, and if I put the picture of myself with my husband on my desk on Monday, in Arizona and 36 other states, I can be fired. Just because. 
my boss can actually say you're being fired because you're gay. I saw that picture. I know you can legally get married now, good for you, but I, I'm firing you because I don't want gay people working here. The person who owns the apartment complex, if I lived in one, could say, oh, you know what, I saw that you got married, and the guy that you're, that's, that's like your husband? No, mm -mm. you can't live here. You'll have to live somewhere else, you can't live here. Those are still, that's still the way it is. So while we have marriage equality, we still have a long, long way to go. But we grow in strength. And I'll tell you how and why we grow in strength. Because today, the modern LGBT movement is not just comprised of LGBT people. It's comprised of corporate America, who were the first to enact non-discrimination clauses in their agreements with their employees, ensuring workplace protection for people who are LGBT. And after corporate America led in that way because they're just smart and they realize one's sexual orientation is not at all an indication of their capacity to do a job in the workplace, slowly some communities around the country, and I'm very proud that while I was mayor, Tempe was one of them, passed non-discrimination ordinances. And then some other conversations took place, and from corporate to local governments uh, to regional governments and regional organizations, the message started spreading because people were willing to be visible. More and more LGBT people were willing to live openly. And what we know from all of the research is that when someone knows someone who is LGBT, they are far less likely to support discrimination and far more likely to support non-discrimination ordinances and laws to protect their friends or their family members or their coworkers or their neighbors who happen to be LGBT. The success of the LGBT movement and that trajectory from Stonewall to marriage a couple of years ago is because of the coalition of the LGBT community with the straight community, with our allies, with people in the employment sectors, and primarily local governments. That has been what has changed the culture and has moved the United States from a nation where when I was one of those 37 openly gay elected officials in 1996, and only 33 to 35 percent of Americans thought that homosexual people should be given a full place in society. That's what it was then. That number today is 78, 79 percent of Americans believe that LGBT people should be given a full place in society. That's not that long a period of time. 96 to 2017, that's a pretty short period of time. The amazing movement and the amazing trajectory of support has only come from people being visible who are LGBT, their allies standing with us, corporate America standing with us because they have a lot of sway over, over what happens in society, especially in the workplace. And so the culture has shifted probably because I worked for the culture-changing organization in the LGBT movement for full equality, I am a big believer that culture leads. And then the politics and the laws will follow. Very rarely will our politicians lead on anything that's controversial. And I say that as a former politician. It just doesn't happen. And especially on our LGBT issues, it just doesn't happen. So we fought, and we made progress, and we've made tremendous progress, and yet we still have so far, so far to go. When I think of all the organizations and all of the allies, uh, I'm struck by uh, the notion that it was a small movement. It was a small movement of people. Uh, the, all the organizations combined, the state organizations, the national organizations, uh, the regional organizations, 
there were more than 500 employees in the United States of America that were working for full equality over the last two decades. Here's a fascinating piece. Half of those were straight. Half of those were not LGBT people working in those organizations. They were people who believed in equality. Maybe they had a family member who was LGBT. Maybe they just cared about social justice and saw the injustice that was taking place and wanted to do something about it. That's been incredibly, incredibly powerful. Probably know the name Sandra Day O'Connor, former Supreme Court Justice from our great state of Arizona. This is what she said once. Real change, when it comes, stems principally from the attitudinal shifts in the population at large. Rare indeed is the legal victory in court or legislature that is not a careful byproduct, byproduct of an emerging social consensus. An emerging social consensus. So when you look at the trajectory of the LGBT movement and overlay democracy in action, democracy in action is what has propelled the LGBT movement because it was democracy in action local, regional, state, and national that created the emerging social consensus that LGBT people were not disordered, were not immoral, it's just who they are. And let's make no mistake, not everyone thinks that way. There are some who have views that uh, we're simply never going to change. We have to recognize that and we have to be respectful of that even as we challenge it. Which is why I started the Religion, Faith, and Values program when I was at GLAD. Because we have to have a dialogue with people who don't understand us and think otherwise. And we have to honestly and respectfully have a conversation about that. For too long in the LGBT movement up until the mid-2000s, we ceded the whole religious argument about sexuality and sexual orientation to the religious right. They were the only voice when it came to talking about religion and sexuality. It was only from what was then the Christian coalition, or then it was the moral majority. Now it's focus on the family. Theirs was the only voice. And so what we realized was that there are people of faith there are welcoming and inclusive congregations that want to be our advocates and want to be our allies, and we should welcome them. We should embrace them. We should help them understand us better, and we should help them talk about LGBT issues in a way that will be helpful. So instead of me, as the president and CEO of the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, going on to CNN all the time and debating people from the religious right, we started training and using people of faith who are inclusive and believed in inclusion when it came to sexual orientation. And I happen to believe that it made the difference. Because it's hard for someone who's not in ministry to have the same kind of credibility debating or talking about uh, the Bible and religious-based defamation and the historical context. Um, I can do it, and I will, just so you understand some of the arguments we had to make. When the Bible is cited as a reason for religious-based defamation and discrimination, we must remind people how the Bible has been used to justify a lot of things that we don't necessarily think are good things today. The owning of other human beings. In the 19th century, during another time of great division in our country, southern ministers defended the owning of slaves by quoting Colossians 3.22. Slaves, obey in all things those who are your earthly masters. Sounds to me like God says it's okay, right? 
A Southern Car South Carolina Baptist leader in 1822 declared that the right of holding slaves is clearly established in the Holy Scriptures. After nearly 100 years plus to the Emancipation Proclamation, a Virginia court defended racial segregation by saying the Almighty God created the races, white, black, yellow, malai, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. He didn't intend for the races to mix and marry. And it took until 1967, 50 years ago, when the Supreme Court rejected that thinking and struck down the laws that still remained in 16 states that said interracial marriage was illegal. Think about that. It's been 50 years this June since that decision. I will admit that I did kind of take a little bit of glee talking to some of the folks who, uh, who held the view uh, that, that same-sex marriage should never be legal. And, uh, and of course, we did our research and so forth, and I knew that these folks were uh, married to someone of a different race. And I, I took some glee in pointing out to them that, hmm, you know, not too long ago would have been illegal for you to be married. Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, it's, this is the law, and what do you think about that? You didn't have much to say about that. But it became more important for people of faith to make those conversations and have those conversations than for the white gay guy who was the leading, the, leading the gay organization. So we have made great progress, but we still have a long way to go. Our trajectory is not complete. Our march is not complete. When I think about the work that we still have to do, especially in marginalized communities, in uh, the Deep South, what's very, very fascinating, my work intersects. In the Deep South, if you put an overlay of the map in the United States where there are more welcoming communities for LGBT people, uh, you will see the Deep South remains very unwelcoming. You will also see that it is in the Deep South, particularly among men of color, where there is a new HIV epidemic. Unbelievable rising amounts of HIV numbers among young men of color in the Deep South. Do you think there's any correlation to the views about people being gay in the Deep South with the transmission of the virus that is 100% preventable in 2017? I think there's a relationship. We know that there's a relationship. So we still have a lot of work that we must do, especially in 